the head coach, Kenny Dillingham, joining us here on the Burns and Gambo Show. We had you in the first few weeks after you got the gig. It's good to have you back, Coach. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in, man. I appreciate it. Glad yeah. to be seen, to say great, the least. Great to see, uh, see you here. I know you're doing some great things with Sun Devil football, so we want to stay on top of that. We want Sun Devil football at the forefront of what's going on, and you've done a great job. We'll, we'll start with something that, that we were talking about before we got on the air. Competition with, with the transfer portal and NAILs. It's it's crazy how many kids just can just give up and go somewhere else if they oh I'm not starting so I'm gonna leave and go somewhere else where it used to be like okay you're not starting beat that kid out go beat that kid out he's a little better than you right now but if you work hard you can beat him out how are you trying to you know bring up competition where guys want to work to get better and beat out players that are ahead of them it's everything we do competition is the lifeblood of your program like. That's the what makes sports fun, like, is competition. Like, everything, I grew up with a big family. Everything we did was compete. <laughs> there was no lay on the couch and watch a movie. It was go outside and play cornhole or bags, whatever you call it. It was shoot hoops. It was play spades. It was play hearts. It was play chess. What, it, you, com- competition is what makes yeah. everything go. When I, when I pull up to the Circle K and there's a guy getting out at the same time as me, I try to beat him in the door. 100%. I try to beat him. And Bernsey knows this. I'm it's the, true. I try to beat that guy. I want to be ahead of that guy. 100%. Yeah. That's how you. That's what competitive people do. It's not a, fl- a switch you turn on and off. It's how you do everything in your life. You want to be the best. And if we don't teach these guys that everything is competitive, I mean, we'll go out in the practice field and we'll play a song, Bruce Buffer. We'll, we'll play randomly throughout practice. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. And this is the main event. Oh, yeah. yeah. And all the guys know they sprint. Michael Buffett. Oh, my fault. My, you said Bruce Buffer. I'm like, is that him or is it my, somebody else? Michael Buffer. My, my, I'm, a, I'm a boxing guy. Okay, well, guy. there we go. You, you should know guy. that. Michael and we, Buffer. we sprint to the south end zone of our practice field and we call out two people on a microphone to go one on one in front of the entire team. To show this play matters. This is the game. This is the pressure. All your friends are watching you compete. You want that pressure. We want that pressure. You have to build the pressure. You have to embrace the pressure. You have to love the competition of the pressure. I I think you actually were right. Bruce Buffer is Michael Buffer's brother. He's also a professional announcer. Is he really? Yeah, he really is. But the well, let's get yeah. ready to rumble. Let's... Oh, that's that's Michael Buffer. I oh. think I think you are. I think you had it right. Coach. He had it right. Okay. Yeah, I think you had it right. Yeah. Don't. don't I, I, I've never boxed, nor would I want to get in the no, ring no, over I, here. I mean, no, no, it's it's it's, it's I, I think it was. I think Bruce. I think Bruce okay. Buffer is what right. you're talking right. about. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, you had it correct. Um, you've been on the job for how long now? Five and a half months, roughly. Five, Six months. Five and a half months. What has been the biggest surprise good? What's been the biggest surprise bad so Good far? is just the players embracing the culture. Like the players coming in and just, man, oh, you guys want me to be 10 minutes early and showing up 10 minutes early. Oh, if I show up late, I have to be here at Saturday at 6 a.m. And no complaints. Accountability. Accountability. Like embracing the accountability that they know what they need to fix. They Has anybody been late? Oh, yeah. And, and have you made them show up at 6 a.m. Oh, on Saturday? That's the, that's the standard. Okay. 6 a.m. But you so, can't deviate, right? Even if it's a star player. Oh, he's there's to- no deviation. The players know that. We, I mean, we have some of our best players who have are in that protocol as mm-hmm. we speak. That's mm-hmm. part of it. Is you The standard is the standard. And it's not a punishment. This is the standard. You either hit it or you make a decision to not hit it. It's not me being the bad guy. It's you making a conscious decision that the juice was not worth the squeeze to wake up to be on time. So guess what? You're going to be at 6 a.m. And it's your choice every day if you want to be on time or if you want to show up on Saturday. It's your choice, not mine. Biggest surprise on the bad side? I'll just say learning how to navigate the political side of college athletics that I've never had to deal with. All the stuff that has nothing to do with coaching. Navigating all of that stuff is tiring, tiresome, <laughs> weary, and it is a pain in the butt. Can you give me an example of uh, uh, a, a specific? <laughs> I'm not going to give you an example of a specific, but just all the other stuff that I'm a ball coach. I started coaching eighth graders. I started coaching freshmen. I knew nobody in athletics in general, and I climbed my way up coaching ball. Point blank. So all of this new stuff. Meeting is with boosters. Not necessarily those. I like people. 
I don't mind going and having a drink with somebody and getting to know people. It's just all the how you operate travel, how you do this thing, how you do that thing. So like all the dotting eyes, crossing T's, the devil in the details. All the stuff that goes a part of being the second largest university in the country and having to do with all of that stuff that is just annoying, for lack of a better term. <laughs> so much talent in the state of Arizona. I know you've got your eye on it. I've heard a lot of good things from a lot of the, you know, a lot of the high school coaches really excited about the direction of ASU football right now, and maybe wanting to make sure that their kids stay home and go to ASU the way so many great players have in the past. Tell me where you're at with that. Working with the high school coaches, getting in. I'm sure you got to go to a bunch of games. You know, making sure that you're front and center, so these kids know that ASU is an option for them. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely front and center, and we're showing that. I mean, look at the staff I hired. I mean, when you talk yeah. about you have you have five guys. Jordan Guano coached high school football here. Yeah, I mean that's incredible when you look at the he staff. Was my, he was my wife's teacher. Unbelievable. Yeah, he was my wife's teacher. <laughs> Crazy. And then she was like one of the managers for the football season yeah. one year. So, so I mean, we we've we've shown that it's important, and we've got some guys who are very interested in us. But this process of recruiting is now done two to three years in advance. So to think I'm going to show up and wave my I'm from here flag, come follow me, and everybody's just going to flock to Kenny Dillingham. Doesn't work That's that way. so unrealistic. <laughs> I wish it did. I wish I could plant my flag and everybody came here. It's not going to work like that. This is going to be a two to three year process to keep these kids in the state. And what are we going to have to show as a program and as an institution is that, one, our institution is committed to putting the finances in to win at a high enough level. And us as a staff are committed, right, to building this program up to be good enough to keep our top players in state. And that's really the challenge. How many head coaches do you have on your staff right now? Former head coaches do you Former have Former head staff? coaches. One, our defense coordinator, our offensive coordinator, our special teams coordinator, our running backs coach, our tight ends coach. Uh, five. Five of the ten have head coaching experience. Clearly by design? Clearly by design. Tell me why. Um, I mean, I know why, but tell, no, me, I mean, tell me how it helps. I mean, I know I why. I mean, when you well, – one thing I learned in my career, when I, when I led a quarterback room, golly, was that easy. They showed up on time. <laughs> they were smart. They did everything right. And there were five kids. Then I led an offense. Or then I led quarterbacks and tight ends. And I'm like, whoa, okay, twice as much responsibility. I have 12 kids I'm responsible for. Then I led an offense. Holy cow. I'm at Auburn and I'm leading 55 people. The responsibility level escalates. So then when you get to, when you have all these head coaches who are used to dealing with 120 kids, right? And now they get to focus on seven. Think about the focus that they have. They're used to putting in the time and the effort and the commitment to 120. Now they're focusing on seven. It's like having a smaller classroom as a teacher. That's exactly right. These guys have been teaching in a lecture hall, and now they get to teach basically study hall. And that is what is so unique about having these head coaches. But how about how about challenging you? I mean, I know you want to be challenged, but you don't you don't want a bunch of yes guys around you. 100%. You want guys that have had the experience and they can pull you aside and say, hey, I don't think you're doing this the right way. Oh, no doubt. And th- that's one thing about me. If anybody knows me, I'm the most unstubborn guy in the world. That's probably my fault is listening to people. Uh, you know, that's my fault. I have standards for what I believe in and what's right and wrong, but I listen to people probably too much, right? And I have probably too much blind faith uh, just because I believe in people. And, like, I'll give you an example of that. I wanted to bring out a basketball hoop to practice for the main event, the competition, and have our players do a one-on-one. I got a basketball out there, throw it off, have a little fun in the middle of practice. And Charlie Regular, our special teams coordinator, is like, Kenny, they're in cleats. They're not going to be able to do these moves. <laughs> Somebody's going to get hurt if we do this. Why don't yeah. we have a shootout? <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? You're probably right. Let's yeah. turn this into a shootout. Good. But it's a great example of me. I'm like, no. If you're going to put a basketball hoop on there, you're playing one-on-one. You're not going out there to shoot. You're going to back somebody down. You have helmets on. You're going to throw an elbow. You're going to put the ball in the hoop, right? And Charlie's like, they're in cleats, Kenny. Let's let's calm down, right? So I have these people that I think outside the box. Reel you in a little bit. Reel me in and say, yeah. I know you think creative and, and probably too outside the box, and they get to put me back in it a little bit. I've got somebody reels me in every day. <laughs> like that's that's his job that's, description. I, seriously, I'm, I'm the highest paid dog walker in America, Kenny. It's... <laughs> It's what I do every single day here on the Burns and Gambo Show. Um, I'm an old school. I've lived here my entire life. Tell me how big of a deal it was to have Jake Plummer around the program. What was it, about a month ago, a month and a yep. half ago? Tell me about Jake being around your guys. Just the aura. He, he He's just so confident 
in a different way. He can never raise his voice and you can feel the confidence. And there's different ways to lead. And you can see why he was so successful as a leader is because he didn't need to be a guy who yelled. He could walk over to you and be like, hey, with a smile on his face, uh, you, you got to take a better drop there. Just like that. Just like wow. that. Wow. Just, like, Just and, calm, and, and, cool, and collective. Calm, cool, collective with a smile. Or, not hey, yelling, not upset, not, yelling, like, not hey, animated. That, that, not that route right there, yeah. that just wasn't good enough. That wasn't good enough right there. We got to do better. But he does it with such a way that's so genuine that you can follow genuine. You can't follow fake. He's real. And that's the thing I respect about Jake is he's real. Everything he does is genuine. That team, not just Jake, but that team captured the hearts and imagination of this valley. You know that. No question. Juan Roque, one of the great offensive linemen, Keith Poole. You go through the list of all the great players they had. That team that made it to the Rose Bowl and almost beat Ohio State and Joe Germain for the national championship. Everybody remembers that team and those players. I mean, if you could have a team like that, you've created something extremely special. 100%. And I firmly believe it's because the culture that was there on that team. And you ask any of those guys that were on that team, uh, Jake in particular, and the culture that was set, the competitiveness that you talked about. Jake told a story about, I can't remember the D-lineman's name, a D-lineman who would sprint to the football in practice. Derek Rogers? Uh, I can't remember okay. his name. I don't, I don't want to just say a random yeah, yeah, name. Yeah. And he goes, because we weren't sprinting to the ball, so we made it an emphasis of practice. So this dude sprinted 40 <laughs> yards. And then the next dude, day, two people sprinted. Then the next day, four people sprinted. And then the next day, it was seven. Next people was all 11. And it started with one person setting the standard for what greatness looks like and competing to be the best, that they would start to compete to be the first one to sprint to the ball 30 yards down the field. And that goes back to what you said, is you compete in everything, and then do you want to win? Like, the goal is to win. Do you want to win? And this is what it takes. I know there's many quarterbacks on your roster. I want to start this segment by asking about Jaden Rashada and, and, and what you've seen out of him and how it relates relative to everything else. Because he's a very high-profile addition to your program. What what can you tell us about him and kind of how he's fit in with the competition? I mean, unbelievable kid. I mean, he's just an unbelievable human being. Humble. I mean, cares about people. Quiet. Understands his role, understands that, you know, he's not going to come in there and people aren't going to instantly respect his leadership and knows that he's got to work for that respect. And then him as a player, I mean, he's super talented, right? He's got a long way to learn and grow in this game still. He's a true freshman, but he embraces that. He tries to come up and learn extra. He texts me all the time watching extra film. And he's like, hey, I'm watching film, watching film, watching film. Not because he has to or because he thinks it impresses me. It's merely because he knows he's so addicted to trying to be better. So I couldn't be more happy with the kid. How you do you think a, he fit? Oh, go ahead. You got a lot of co- competition at quarterback though. With three guys battling for the job right now? We do. We have uh we have those we have those, him and then we have the other two who are both, you know, starters in, in Power 5 football in the past who are both really talented. Both can't play golf uh, at all. <laughs> right? We played yesterday, including myself. Well, none of us can play golf. Only coach Baldwin can. But the uh those two are just they're, they're, they're friends, they're buddies, they're super smart, they're intelligent, and, uh, I mean, we're, we're in a good spot. I, I Look, I know fall ball, Camp Tanazona practices, you, you guys are kind of going into the slow part now if there is such a thing in the college season where there's not going to be a whole lot going on, and then things are obviously going to ramp up very quickly. When do you want to know who your starting quarterback is going to be? When do, when do you feel like you need to know who your starter is going to be? Well, definitely going into week one. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not a person that hides who the starter is. I... I, I so when you ha- when you have a decision, you will announce it. Hundred percent. You won't you won't play coy. There you won't, won't play be, the game. There will not you be won't... games. Okay. There's not a the comp- in my opinion the competitive advantage of another team knowing your starter is Minimal. is not nearly worth your team not knowing who the starter is and getting the leader in front of your team. That's a great point. So uh, you know the the whole shell game of who the starter is. <clears throat> Give me, let me push the the person who deserves the job so the team can follow somebody. Uh, so when when we know a starter, we'll announce it. Now the latest we'll announce one is going into the game week because if not if one doesn't emerge and name himself, right? If That's not, not if, good. That's not then good. Then guess what? 
us as a staff are going to have to pick who that guy is. I hope somebody emerges themselves and everybody knows who that yeah, is. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you, is, is there an ideal time for you to say, that's the guy? I mean, I would I would assume the more time, the better for that player to get ready, right? 100%. The, the earlier that somebody emerges, the better it would be. But it's also, a, you know, it could be a good sign if you have two people that maybe are both having a great camp. Right. And they don't separate. Now it could be a bad sign if the opposite happens. Two people have a bad camp and they don't separate themselves. So the key is, is there a separation that everybody on the team can see? It shouldn't be me announcing the starter. It should be this team expecting when am I going to announce the starter? There's a difference. The team knows there's a starter. It's clear. I just announce it versus, oh, crap, who's the starter? Right. And if it gets to a point where who's the starter, that comes to a point where myself and, uh, you know, our coaching staff coach Baldwin have to make that decision going into week one where we have to decide who gives us the best chance to win. Tell me about Cam Tatazona because I remember when I, I, I came here, Bruce Snyder was the coach, so I've been through all the coaches since Bruce Snyder. I started doing this show in 1997. So Bruce loved Cam T, but other coaches that followed – a lot of them didn't. They didn't love it. They liked. They'd rather be here. Right? Everything was more accessible here. But some coaches like to get away, build that camaraderie. What's your thoughts on Camp T? Well, one, it's. I mean, it's not the greatest place to house. It's not the. It is challenging. It's right. challenging. The There's field yes. when it rains. The, the not good cell service. The bunks with each other. Yes. It's the shout. Everything is challenging. Well, isn't that what football and life is about? Like, you're not always comfortable. You don't wake up every day and say, oh, I feel great. you got to wake up every day and you're like, golly, I slept like crap. But guess what? I have meetings, I have practice, I gotta and go i got to go it. perform. And I think that's what Camp T does is it puts that a little bit of a dirt on a wound where we say, no, you're not going to get a Band-Aid and, you know, oxygen. Suck it up, buttercup. And it's time to freaking go to work. It's time to grind a little bit. And I've already talked to our players. We're going to limit the use of cell phones at Camp T. We're going to get it before a little bit before. Before practice, a little bit after, cell phones are done. We're going to talk to each other. We're going to do this thing called play spades and play dice and play cards and play bags. Oh, and we're going to actually build a team, not stare at cell phones for three days. You sound like a parent of young kids. You sound like every parent of young kids everywhere. Like, put the phone down. Put the phone down, right? Cornhole, cornhole, oh, right? yeah. We're going to do everything that's competitive because com- that's what it's about. You can't, like... How you long gotta, are you there for? How long are you there for? We're there for Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, come back Saturday. Okay, and three sa- days. Saturday's the scrimmage, which everybody can come out to. Okay, so three full days there, just get uncomfortable, and just keep the tradition alive a little bit, yeah, right? We, wanna, we want people to feel this. Everybody always talks about the moment, right? When people talk about their struggle, it's... It's never when they look back. When you look back at a struggle, it's an experience you're glad you went through. Sure. It's the moment people get trapped in of the waiting for the struggle. So right now, everybody's, oh my gosh, Camp D is going to be so miserable. Oh my gosh. But then when you're there and you're in it. Embrace it. Embrace it. And then it's over and you remember it forever. Yeah. It's that simple. And are we going to hide away from this challenging experience because you're scared of three and a half days? This is something you're going to remember forever. You're going to remember, we have triple bunks. There's a bunk room with a bunk on the bottom, a bunk in the middle, a bunk on top. And these kids are going to tell that story about their triple bunks when they're 50 years old on the golf course with their old teammate, or they're going to tell their son or their daughter, I stayed in a triple bunk at Camp T with no cell phone. You couldn't even imagine what I went through. That's what sports are about, are the memories and the experiences. You don't seem to shy away from the challenging stuff. So I'll, and I'm not trying to be a challenging, you know, uh, questionnaire here, but the comments you made after the spring game, it seemed like you weren't very happy with. Is that, now that you've had time to reflect on the spring game and the people that were there, do you have any further thoughts on that or any evolved thoughts on the spring game and, and how many people were or weren't there, Coach? Yeah, I mean, for me, one thing I appreciate everybody that was there. That's the first thing because it the, the the I think the numbers were three times what was the prior year. So, one, I appreciate everybody that was there. Two, I've got to do a better job, and we have to, as a university, do a better job getting it out there, maybe putting it at night because people said it was a little hot. Maybe we've got to do a better job strategically helping the Valley. We live and we learn, so I'll take some of the blame as well. But at the And then at the last piece is people got to believe. People got to sacrifice a little bit. If people want us to be 
this program that everybody knows is this quote unquote sleeping giant, though that place, we all got to wake up. It's not a sleeping giant. It's the Trojan horse that everybody's inside of it. And it's not just the, the horse. It's everybody's got to get out of that horse. And everybody's got to do their part from myself to our staff, to administration, to the fans, to the community, to the local radio like you guys. Everybody's got to be, push us in the same direction because that's how you win in college athletics is continuity in a group of people in a city behind you. So I think that's the goal next year is I got to do better. That's what I took away from it when I when I look back at it is point the finger at myself and find a way that I can make it a better experience because obviously I didn't do a good enough job making it a good enough experience. I know the first three games were all 7 o'clock at night. That's a good thing. People like coming out when it's 7 o'clock at night. Sun's going down. It'll be perfect for those first three games. But leave me with this. I only got one more before we have to let you go. I've heard a lot of good things about the players all hanging around, the camaraderie, just having fun again. Football's fun again. They're enjoying it. They're hanging around the, the, the lounge room, right? The guys don't want to necessarily do their work and go home right away. Isn't that a good sign that guys want to hang around the program? It's a great sign. And uh, when you talk about the players and they would practice then leave last year, and this year they're staying around for an hour, hour and a half after practice. Just hanging out. Playing chess with each other in the locker room. We have chess boards in the locker room, playing chess, playing Madden, playing ping pong, playing pool. They play this game where they look different directions and you got to look the other way shadow boxing or something i don't understand it but i did beat some players at it Good. right so <laughs> it's just because if i go in the locker room and they're competing guess what i'm going to do i'm going to go compete with them and so i think everything we do in this program right is if i can compete with you in it i'm going to and i tell them all the time i am unathletic so i'll compete with you in anything that doesn't take athleticism and i will beat your butt <laughs> so bring it and that's the culture and that's the fun and we say we're gonna have more fun than anybody in the country working harder than anybody in the country our practices in the spring we put together 30 percent more output per practice than the prior year which means if their workload was 100%, we were 130% because we can chart those now. So we worked 30% harder, and the kids had 100,000% more fun. All because of competition. Competition is fun. Coach, it's been a lot of fun having you in here for two segments. It's You're always a bundle of energy. You're always it's welcome. great. Yeah, seriously, it's like I don't need my afternoon cup of coffee, man. I just talked to you for <laughs> half an hour. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, I know we'll talk to you when the season starts, and we'll have you on many, many more times. We appreciate you coming in. Really, really Perfect. do. Thank appreciate you. y'all having me. You got it.